For those of you who may not have yet met, uh, met yet, my name's Dave. I have the great privilege of being a lead pastor. Uh, Kelsey's my boss, though. She says, Dave, this is what we're doing for kids ministry. And I say, go for it. It's awesome. We have a passion for vibrant kids ministry. And if you're here today and you have kids or grandkids or nieces and nephews, we understand what you're um, interacting with on a regular day, the blessings, the challenges that go with it. I have an eight-year-old, a six-year-old, and a four-year-old at home. And uh, I was building my deck this past week and I got my eight-year-old and six-year-old boys to help me move deck boards from the driveway out front to the, the backstage. And uh, I said to them, can you do this? And if you do it and help me build a deck, I'll take you out for ice cream later. I think this is a pretty good deal. And the six-year-old's taking this board down with his eight-year-old brother, one board at a time. That's all they can handle. And he goes, ugh, now I know what slave labor is. <laughs> so we understand deeply the blessings and the challenges that go along with that. Let's pray and we'll dive in. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that all week our kids learned about Joseph and about Jesus. And as we dive into one of those stories ourselves where Joseph is sold into slavery, God, we pray that my words would fall down, that your words would be lifted up, and that by the power of you, what you are doing, you would help people to see how great and how awesome this story is. And even though it's nearly 4,000 years old, how it still deeply connects with us today. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Three stories in three consecutive days. Two weeks ago, it's the August long weekend. I'm connecting with some people before the first service, and these people love Jesus. They are committed to who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing, and they look at me and they say, Dave, how long is this anger and this frustration going to be in the world? It seems like people are on either sides of every issue, and there's this frustration, and there's this venom, and we can't trust people. I thought, man, it's, it's tough. What do I say in this situation? The very next day, August long weekend, Monday morning, I invite a contractor over to give me some ideas how to start building that deck, and we're talking a little bit, and then we go out to my driveway. He's got his elbow up on his, the back of his truck. Uh, he's only missing the toothpick in his mouth, and he's just like, Dave, I got a question for you. There's so much anger in the world. How do we deal with this? How do we talk to people? Why is there so much frustration and unknowing and the inflation? What do we do with all of this? Tuesday night. I'm out refing a soccer game. I'm paired up with an older gentleman. And I said, hey, do you have any kids? And he goes, yeah, I've got three kids, 30 and two in their 20s. I said, do you have any grandkids? And he goes, no, 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 no. And I hope I never have any grandkids, which isn't the normal response. And so I say to him, well, how come you don't want any grandkids? And he looks at me and he says, Dave, what is going on in the world right now? Everybody seems angry and frustrated and the inflation and the uncertainty and can we trust our government and what's going on around the world? Three conversations in three days. Now you might be sitting here going, Dave, this is a celebratory Sunday. That's not exactly a celebratory introduction. But it got me thinking, if these three people are having three interactions with me in the span of three days, how many of you are thinking the same thing? I don't know if I can handle this inflation anymore. My mortgage is about due, and I can't go from 2.5% to 4.5%. That's going to crush me. Have you seen the prices in the grocery store? Maybe you're buying kid supplies at Walmart or Staples, and you're going, I don't know if I can do this. I want to have a conversation with somebody on the opposite side of the political spectrum as me, but I don't know how that's going to go. I just want to have a friendly conversation. What's this world my kids are growing up in? And we have these questions, and we're crying out, God, are you here? Are you involved in any of this? Do you know what's going on, or are you just going to be absent forever? These are big questions. Big questions that God has answers for. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open them up to Genesis chapter 37. If you're brand new to church, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you um, that's yours to keep. If you don't own a Bible, if you have a smartphone with you, you're more than welcome to download the app and you can have a Bible with you wherever you go. Big numbers are the chapter numbers, small numbers are the verse numbers. And a shout out to my friend Colin. He said to me earlier this week, Dave, this is my favorite story in all the scripture. So Colin, I hope you enjoy this. But here's what's going on. As you open to that very first book in chapter 37, here's the story so far. First 11 chapters of Genesis go by really quick. God creates the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. He creates Adam and Eve, and they're in the Garden of Eden. And he says, you can do whatever you want as long as you don't eat from this one tree. But humanity is not very good at following rules. So Adam and Eve decide to eat from the tree. They get kicked out of the paradise in the garden. 
They have two kids, Cain and Abel, and Cain looks at his younger brother and he's like, I don't like the way you're looking at me. I'm going to kill you. A little bit of foreshadowing for what's gonna happen later on in Genesis chapter 37. And eventually things just get worse and worse and eventually we reach Genesis chapter six and God's like, I don't know if I really am happy about everything that's going on here. I'm going to send a worldwide flood and I'm gonna save one family. The flood comes and goes, it destroys nearly everything on the earth. This one family comes out of the boat and it starts all over again. And it gets worse and worse and worse. And God says, you know, I've made a promise, I'm not going to destroy the world again, but now I'm going to pick one man and I'm gonna give a blessing to him and he's gonna be a blessing to all nations and he is going to be the father of a great nation. This is what he says to a man by the name of Abraham. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Abraham eventually in his old age has a son named Isaac. Isaac has two kids, Jacob and Esau. Jacob has 12 kids himself. And this is where our story picks up. Now, one thing, we're going to enter into a pretty long chapter. And if you enjoy following along, I want you to try to pick out the turning point. What's the big idea? What's the key verse that's going to unlock the rest of the passage? This is the arrogance of Joseph, Genesis 37, 1 to 11. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons. Listen to that line. Because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the rest of the brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to mine. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to insult us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream. And he said it to his brothers again and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept these sayings in mind. Now there's not a lot to like about Joseph here. The moment we're introduced to him, he immediately tattles. He's 17 years old, he's pasturing the flock with his brothers, and he comes back to dad and he says, Dad, my brothers are bad guys. Now you might say, well, you know, maybe we give Joseph the benefit of the doubt. Maybe uh, his brothers were taking sheep and rolling them down the hill. Maybe they went over to the neighbor's yard and did some cow tipping in the middle of the night. Maybe they weren't so bad. But this word bad report means to defame or to speak with hostility. This isn't an auditor showing up and here's the factual statement to his dad, Jacob. This is a young man who hates his brothers as well. There's malice present, and this disrespect goes both ways. And then as if tattling on his brothers isn't bad enough, he shows up with these dreams. Now, I'm not sure if you ever dream big dreams or you want to discuss them with your family or your coworkers, but sometimes you have these dreams and you think, oh, I need to tell somebody. And so you say to your family member, you wouldn't believe this dream I had, and your family member probably leans in. And then you say, one day, you're going to bow down before me and kiss my ring. How do you think your siblings are going to respond to that? As one commentator says, Joseph, at the very least, is a sociopath who doesn't care about the feelings of others. At worst, he's becoming arrogant, cruel, unfeeling, and enjoying putting others down. Unfortunately, it's the latter. To make matters worse, he's his dad's favorite. Now, it's one thing if your brother's a jerk. It's another thing if you know dad likes him more than the rest of us. But why does Jacob like Joseph so much? 
If you enjoy reading the book of Genesis and you're new to church or you don't know what to read regularly in your Bible, pick up the book of Genesis. These stories are amazing. Here's a little bit of a family breakdown and you can see what happens. You have Abraham, he has a son named Isaac. Isaac has Jacob and Esau. Jacob has four wives, and between those four wives, there's 12 kids. Now, first things first, polygamy is not endorsed by the Bible. (laughs) And if you're reading this and going, well, it looks like it is. (laughs) Every time a man has multiple wives, it ends in disaster. I think I'm a pretty good husband. I'm having a hard time keeping one lady happy. You know what I mean? Of Jacob's four wives, he loves Rachel the most, but Rachel can't get pregnant. So he starts sleeping with Rachel's older sister, Leah. She is blessed with four boys, and she is thrilled. Well, Rachel says, well, if I can't get pregnant, I'm going to give you my servant. Sleep with her. She'll have kids for me. And she does. And Leah says, well, if you're going to do that, Rachel, then I'm going to do it too. So Leah says, have my servant. Jacob sleeps with her. More kids arrive. And finally, Rachel, in her old age, gets pregnant. And Jacob's favorite wife has a son, and he becomes his favorite kid. Well, Joseph is just eating this up. He gets special clothes, he gets special favor, he even gets special jobs. The cloak that uh, Joseph is wearing, and you'll pick this up if you listen closely to the verses 1 to 11 and following, it's not just that it's this beautiful long robe, it's that it means he's not going to work the field. Joseph gets to be the manager, and brother number 11 out of 12 gets to be the boss of the older brothers. So for those of you who are first born, and I'm not asking for a raise of hands, how many of you would be thrilled if your little brother or sister walked up to you and said, hey, I'm the boss now? (laughs) Not going over well. For those of you who are the youngest in the room, not asking for a show of hands, how many of you are going, da-da-da-da-da, I'm loving this. I get to be the new boss. His older siblings, not impressed. If you enjoy marking up your Bible or or your phone, you'll notice in verses 4, 5, and 8, the brothers hate him. The brothers hate him. The brothers hate him. This would make you a little hardened towards your brother, not exactly going out of your way to help him. That leads us to the second part. This is the callousness of the brothers, verses 13, pardon me, 12 to 28. Now, as brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem, notice Joseph doesn't go with them. And Israel uh, and Jacob says to Joseph, pardon me, Israel and Jacob are the exact same person, just a name change. Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to them, here I, I am. So he said to him, go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring me word. So he sent him to the valley of, from the valley of Hebron to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields and the man asked him, what are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? And the man said, they have gone away, for I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams." But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood. Just throw him into a pit here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hands, restore to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of the robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat. Looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we just kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let us not our hand be upon him for he is our brother and our flesh. His brothers listened to him. Then the Midianite traders passed by and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. If you're new to Ellerslie, um, I love maps. (laughs) I'm a geek. 
And so what happens here is we hear this story and we forget that these are real people in real places and that this story actually took place 4,000 years ago. So here's what's going on. And I have a laser pointer that might help. Um, we have Hebron down at the bottom here. And he's traveling 80 kilometers up to Shechem. That's about a four-day journey. He arrives at Shechem, and somebody says to him, no, they've gone up to Doth, and that's another 50 kilometers and another three-day journey. And then some traders come down and take him all the way down to Egypt. He has traveled a long way to help out. And his brothers are not impressed. His brothers are thinking, we need to kill this dreamer. We don't want him in his life anymore. And then Reuben shows up, and they saw him from afar, and he says, um, I just don't want this kid in my life anymore. For those of you who are the older sibling, imagine the younger siblings coming up to you and saying, hey, I'm your boss now, and you smile and nod in front of mom and dad, but then you whisper to your younger brother or sister, just wait till mom and dad leave. Then you're going to pay. But this isn't just to take him behind the shed and beat him. They are genuinely talking about killing him. Then Reuben, the firstborn son, the oldest of Jacob, says, shed no blood. Throw him into the pit here in the wilderness. Don't lay a hand on him. Now, we might hear that as the readers and go, attaboy, Reuben. At least somebody in this family isn't so messed up. We'd be totally wrong. This family is messed up. And like I said just a couple minutes ago, reading the book of Genesis is fascinating. The dad, Jacob, takes his favorite wife, Rachel, on a trip. And he leads Reuben and the other brothers together. And do you know what Reuben does? He goes and sleeps with his father's concubine. Reuben is not in the good books with his dad. And so he figures the way I can get in the good books is to say, you know what, my brothers all wanted to kill Joseph, but I had them just throw him in a pit. I rescued him from the pit. I brought him back, and now I'd like my double inheritance, please. All the brothers think, okay, we can go along with this, and they take him into the pit, and you'll notice here in verse 24, it's not just any pit. It's a pit that used to be a cistern, and the author goes out of his way to say there is no water in it. So they've stripped him of his cloak. He might die from the cold. They throw him in a cistern, there is no water, and there's obviously no food, and they're saying, well, we didn't kill him. We didn't shed his blood. He just happened to die of natural causes. He'll die of cold, of hunger, of thirst. And the brothers, they don't even remotely care. After throwing him into the pit, they sit down and have a meal. It's like a psychotic king who says to somebody, off with his head, and then goes and hosts a feast. These brothers do not like Joseph. And Judah's not exactly authentic either. Judah says, well, instead of killing him, let's actually make some money off this guy. 20 shekels of silver 4,000 years ago was the going rate for a slave. There's nothing special there other than saying, hey, each of us can split this 11 ways. And so Joseph is gone. And they expect that they will never see him again. So what happens to dad? This is the deception of Jacob. Picking up in verse 29, when Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, the boy is gone and I, where shall I go? And then, they, then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe into blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, we found, please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And Jacob identified it and said, it is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. And Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son for many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him and he refused to be comforted and said, no, I shall go down to Sheol to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Hebrew narrative isn't like the novels that might be on our nightstand or that we would find at a bookstore or the library. Hebrew narrative is short, to the point, and doesn't waste any words. Reuben had just come back from his shift of caring for the flock, and he shows up and he says, where is Joseph? Where have you taken him? And you read in verse 30, the boy is gone, where shall I go? As the oldest brother, it's his responsibility to take care of Joseph. He's the one who's supposed to bring him back to Jacob. He's the one to say, Dad, I have found your son. They were going to kill him. I have brought him back. This is it. And he's asking the question, where did he go? 
How do his brothers respond? Not a single word. They simply take Joseph's cloak, dip it in blood, and say. Returning to the cloak to Jacob, notice the deception that takes place. They never lie. They never explain what happens. Instead, they simply imply that something bad has happened. This we found, Father. Identify, is it your sons or not? Well, of course it's Joseph's. But they never actually lied to Jacob. Unlike Reuben, Jacob's mourning is genuine. Jacob tore his garments, put sackcloth on his lines, loins, and mourned for his son many days. His favorite wife has passed away. His favorite son is dead. Once again, though, there's a fascinating backstory. Remember the family line again. We have Abraham, who was given the blessing from God. Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has two kids named Jacob and Esau. Isaac loves Esau more. His wife loves Jacob more. And one day while Esau is out in the field hunting, his wife grabs Jacob and says, here, I want you to put on Esau's cloak. Cover your arms in goat skin so that you're like your brother and go receive your brother's blessing from your dad. One commentator says it beautifully. Jacob's deception by his sons using Joseph's cloak and a slaughtered goat mirrors the way Jacob had deceived his own father by using Esau's cloak and two goatskins. The deceiver has been deceived. I know I'm repeating myself, but the book of Genesis is incredible with all sorts of stories. Now this is pretty entertaining. If you were to go out for supper with, uh, with uh, with Jacob's sons, you'd be in rapt attention going, Joseph did what to you? Then you ran away? Then you did this to him? Tell me, how on earth does this story unpack? And we look at what's taking place. We look at this arrogance of Joseph who shows up and says, one day, brothers, you guys are all going to bow down to me. And we can understand how the older brothers would get a little bit callous. Hey, I think, dreamer, that might be a little extensive. But they are so callous, they take this brother, throw him in a pit, eventually sell him into slavery, and think, well, at least now we're done with that. Then they go home to their dad, not really hoping to win their favor, but to just think, "Ah, at least this guy is out of the way. Now I asked you at the beginning to listen along, to pick out of these, I believe there's 37 verses. What's the key? What helps you understand what this is all about? And maybe you wrote it down, and if you did, you can whisper to your person sitting beside you. What unlocks this passage? Because it's not just there is a good story. The story has a point. So what is the verse that helps us understand all of this? Now you might say it's the dreams. That tells us what's going to happen in the future. Maybe it's, it's the cloak dipped in blood. Maybe it's the selling into slavery. And all of these would be great guesses. But I don't think it's right. The verse that I believe unlocks this entire passage is probably the verse you skim over whenever you read this. I believe it's verses 15 to 17, where Joseph, on the way to Shechem, meets a stranger. And the stranger says, oh, your brothers are up here in Dothan. This whole passage, I believe, is about the hiddenness of God. God is never mentioned in the entirety of the chapter. There is no angel. There is no voice from heaven. The narrator never mentions him. And God is hidden this whole time, but he is not absent. God gives Joseph the dreams. God allows the hatred to grow. God sent the brothers not to the next mountain, but to the next town. And God, in all of his power, places a random farmer near the 11 brothers who happens to overhear that they're leaving Shechem and going to Doth. And then God, in all of his power, places that same farmer right in Joseph's path and says, your brothers aren't here. They're in Dothan. 
What becomes and looks like a throwaway line becomes the most important verse in the chapter. Without this interaction, Joseph would have returned back home. Joseph would have never been sold into Egypt. Joseph would have never worked for the king of Egypt. Joseph never would have been in a place to have the things and God work through him the way God did. The author wants us to infer from this very incident, God is at work. God made sure that Joseph would meet up with his brothers despite what they did to him. And it's the reason in Genesis 50 verse 20, looking at his brothers, Joseph can say, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Now, some of you love that. And some of you might not be convinced. Dave, the hiddenness of God. Did you know that Dothan is only mentioned twice in all of scripture? It sounds like a big city. It sounds like a city of great importance. It's mentioned twice. Here in Genesis chapter 37 and one more time in 2 Kings 6. And you might say, 2 Kings 6. What's important about that? A great story from the prophet Elisha. Elisha is being hunted down by the king of Syria. And so the king of Syria sends an entire army to capture him. He sends uh, his army commanders, he sends horses, he sends chariots to Dothan to stand outside of the prophet's house. And so the prophet's servant goes out early in the morning, opens the front door to grab the newspaper or something, and looks out and sees an entire Syrian army, slams the door shut, runs back into Elisha and says, Elisha, the army is here from Syria to capture you and we don't know what they're going to do with you. And Elisha says, I don't worry about it. And the servant says, no, I don't think you understand. There's an army outside. And then Elisha says, the power of God is so much greater than the power of Syria. Look at this. Then Elisha prayed and said, oh Lord, please open his eyes that he might see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. Twice in Dothan, the hiddenness of God working behind the scenes in ways that we could never see or expect. I don't know if that introduction resonated with you or not, but three conversations in three days, what are we going to do with all this inflation? What do we do when we just want to have a conversation about politics that doesn't blow up in our face? How do we raise our kids in a world that's constantly changing? How are we going to make our bills meet? The hiddenness of God. He is hidden but he is not absent. God is always doing something. He is never doing nothing. And God is present and working in ways that we cannot even begin to imagine all around us. You see, Joseph was hated by his brothers and Joseph wasn't nice to them either. And God could have sent an angel. God could have used dreams again, but it probably would have just made Joseph more arrogant. And so God had to work in Joseph's life. He had to help him understand, you're going to suffer. You're going to be rejected by your brothers. You're going to spend a couple years in prison. Life is not going to go well for you. But then at the very end, you are going to be changed. And in your weakness and when you acknowledge that you can't figure this out anymore, I am going to use you in powerful ways. You see, God could just show up. God could knock on our doors so we open up and then we receive the words that he wants us to hear at that exact time. But we might not respond the way we need to. There is something about growing in the suffering, growing in the rejection, growing in God by saying, I need to be weak so that you can be strong. And because Joseph suffered, was rejected, and used his weakness, he saved his entire family. But the good news Every week, one greater than Joseph has come. And Jesus showed up. And Jesus himself was rejected and sold, not for 20 coins, but for 30 coins. And after Jesus was rejected, he was suffered in massive ways by being flogged over and over again, by being spat on, by being punched by the Roman soldiers, by being mocked. And then Jesus, allowing himself to be placed upon that cross, in his weakness, died for all of humanity. Not so that one family would be saved, but so everybody would be saved. Anyone who calls on the name of Jesus, the hiddenness of God, his power is at work all around us.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Genesis chapter 37, and thank you for the reminder that while you are hidden, you are not absent, and that you are never doing nothing, and you are always at work. And God, wherever we are, whether this has been a tremendous week or been a really difficult week or anywhere in between, that we would be reminded of how great and how awesome you are and that you are always at work around us. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.